Welcome everyone to episode 266 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff in podcast two. Today I conclude my conversation with Talina Winters. And upon listening to our part one, we didn't quite get to how she became a writer. Exactly, anyway. Um, we talked a little bit, but not in full detail. This conversation goes in some very interesting places. Good places, bad places, and lots of cool things in between. This kind of conversation is the epitome of what I try to do on Just Joshing, and I really enjoyed it. So, Talina, thank you very, very much. We're going to get into the conversation relatively quick here because i got a lot of housekeeping at the end of this episode. But first, let's get to some housekeeping from our sponsors this month. And then we get to part two. The following podcast is sponsored by author, editor, Talina Winters. Talina has just released her book, The Undine's Tear, which is book one of the Rise of the Gregory trilogy. It is a young adult setting, which has a very interesting take on mermaids and mermen, which are called Undines. You can find this book on Amazon, Cobalt, and all available book platforms, or you can get more information on TalinaWinters.com or through her in social media channels at Talina Winters. And by the Raven Podcast. The Raven Podcast is the brainchild of Jason Lavelle. Each episode, he actually narrates a story from an author, and then him and the author get together and they talk, do an interview about the story. Uh, this is a perfect commute podcast on the way to work. It's They're short and very memorable. I really dig Jason's take on interviews and how he conducts himself in telling stories. He's an awesome narrator. He's a great guy, and this is a great podcast. Check it out at theravenpodcast.com or on any podcast app you are aware of. And by Adam Dries. Adam Dries' latest book is Five Critical Things for Successful Book Signings. It is one of the best books you can read on how to conduct yourself at a book signing, book presentation, speech, you name it. Adam is a fantastic writer, but he's also a fantastic presenter. And this book is for any author trying to get as good as he is. Check out the book on any available platform, Amazon, Kobo, or brick and mortar bookstores as well. Hey, we should get back to how you got in the writing. Okay, sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that but, seems like a good spot. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, even I'm gonna I'm gonna back it up to 2014 just because some of the stuff you've been talking about about the things you've been learning, I have learned some similar things. So in 2014, I was kind of revamping my idea of what I wanted to do. Um, I, I wasn't enjoying my job. My, my business, I should say, selling saddle pads online anymore. My mother had actually sold the company to someone else, and they were running it very differently. And I, I was, you know, that was my only product. So I didn't enjoy what I was doing. They were making changes that were also making my, my business less profitable. And I'm like, I need to find a, I, I need to find something else. I either have to go get a, a job, um, which I couldn't really do with a little one. Or, you know, not easily. I mean, my priority has always been to stay home with my kids. And, like, kudos to the moms who, who, who go out there and work, too. That's, I have no judgment on that. But for me, that was just my, like, this is what I want to do. And I've always just found a way to make money while I'm doing that kind of thing. And I've always worked really long hours because of that. Because I wanted to spend that day with my kids and then I would work at night kind of thing. Anyways, so at that point in 2014, I'm like, you know, I've kind of always, I'm, I'm an encourager. And so I wanted my brand to be built on inspiration. And I, I wasn't really sure what I meant by that at that point, but I started to think about it. I was also kind of revamping things. I had a music blog, I had a personal blog, I had a, a blog for the saddle pads, it was, and then I wasn't doing any of them well. <laughs> you know, and it was just kind of like, ah, oh, I need to redo stuff. So I did a lot of rethinking about my brand and ended up creating a new website, the one I have now, where I amalgamated all my creative aspects. Because I'm also a knitwear designer. I'd started doing that at one point to, to support my yarn habit. <laughs> I know. So I, I, I sell and I, I create design knitting patterns and I just sell the patterns. I just knit because that's how I relax. Now you know. <laughs> so <laughs> you guys should see Josh's face right now. He is laughing so hard. <laughs> Okay. You, you, you go. I'm just like, yes. I, I, you're, you're amusing. You are very amusing. Um, so, anyways, uh, 2015, I finally get my book um, edited. By the way, the one that one author I asked.
last shirt that she used for this mermaid novel, which she had self-published because, uh, even though she had been from a traditional publishing background, because what I was meaning about the Christian publishing industry being hit or miss is because of that sanitized version, there's actually really strict standards if you want to go traditional publishing through the Christian publishing industry. Yes. Um, and so that's why I, would, I had come across her and I knew that this was independently published and so I asked her and I got the name of her editor whom she recommended and who turned out to be eminently affordable and a fantastic writing coach. I am so thankful for that. Um, she was an American, she is an American woman named Laura Doncia and I highly recommend her. Um, and we worked really well together. We hit it off. I learned so much from publishing that book. And it also started opening up some other opportunities for me in my community. So anyways, June 2nd, 2015, I finally upload the final finished files of the Friday Night Date Dress to Ingram Spark, who, is, who I decided to use as my distributor. Bought with it, I didn't know what I was doing. I think it was like 3 in the morning when I went to bed. And at 8 o'clock the next morning, our youngest son was run over by my husband's car because he ran out behind my husband while he was backing up. So that changed our lives forever, obviously. If I tear up, I mean, I can talk about it for the most part, but, um, you know, I'll be fine. Anyway, so that was hugely traumatic, uh, obviously. Um, my other three children were also in the vehicle at the time, and I didn't see it, but I was the one holding him as we rushed to the hospital, and he died. So, um, thank you. I appreciate that. Anyways... The interesting thing is because I blog, had been blogging for so long, um, I was already kind of a public personality. Uh, we were well known in the community. Our story, our adoption story was actually pretty well known in the community because the other family had a lot of connections as well. Um, I'm from Peace River. I'm not sure I even mentioned that. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, like literally we went, we were in the hospital for two hours. By the time I left the hospital, we are, I already had voicemail messages from people offering to bring casseroles, like professional colleagues, a piano teachers association kind of thing, because I teach piano. And, you know, like, news just spread like wildfire, like more so than you would think. Um, and I was, we were blown away. We were so humbled by the outpouring of support and love from our community uh, from this. So if you guys ever wonder what, what's so special about the North, that people live there, that is what is special about the North. It is an amazing, amazing community. Anyway, um, so I basically blogged my grief. And it was it was strange. I, I, put, I wrote Levi's eulogy, and my husband delivered it. My husband's a fantastic guy, by the way. <laughs> gathered that I, I'm a big fan um, and you know we kind of you get through that on shock everybody's like how do you do that but we were still in shock you know and then it kind of all hits afterwards but that blog post was probably the most uh, it was the most viral post I've ever had and we just had it got a lot of attention from my, my blog got a lot of attention from that as I continued to grieve because I grieved very raw, very publicly, and questioned a lot of things. Um, I'd actually already been grieving that year because earlier in the year something happened in our family. I'm not it's not my story to tell, so I don't I can't diverge it. But my point is that up until that point, I'd already been grieving probably the worst I've ever grieved in my life for four months, and then that happened. Which, which brought up a whole new and level it of it. A, yeah, it was, yeah. Because then now I also had trauma, you know, to deal with, um, PTSD set in, that kind of thing. So, I was going through this on my blog, and that whole, you know, basically I was processing, and I was moving through my grief really well, but it was also helping other people process mm -hmm. as they were reading through some of this stuff because, because I was were, so you, open about you, it. You were so open and you were saying things that other people were feeling. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, um, I don't know, I think something through that process, as I got further along, and also my book, like, the book came out, like, three weeks later, right? And, and I was just like, you know, like, all of a sudden I went from being 24-7 caregiver to that fall, my kids go to school, I'm home by myself, and I'm like, I have no idea what to do. 
Like, you're talking about me being busy all the time? Yeah, like, imagine me all of a sudden going... It was completely out of your comfort zone. I have nothing to what, do, what, and I needed that. What, yeah, no, 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 you... you yeah, that, that, I can see that was a good point in your life. You needed that point, but I could imagine how discomfortable that would have been for you because you're someone that you even now I can just tell there's some things you talk about like that but me laugh my ass off earlier <laughs> you're right you like you like doing and you, yeah. you're, you're that kind of person like you need to go out and just find something just do it and that's great but in that moment in that point in time you had nothing to do and you it was both probably Joe be mad but also probably I mean it was probably one of the best things that happened to you at that point in time as well because if for the first time in a long time it was just you and yeah. then you can't and, and those moments are great because it's just you you can't run and you can run but you can't hide anymore it's just yeah. who you are in this moment at this time right yeah, well, for my personal development, yes. I mean, that obviously it, it revolutionized how I looked at a lot of things. Um, one thing that people... So a question that, that I had to answer for myself is, uh, you know, like... And I kind of already had in my first book was, why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, so that was a theme in my first book. And while I wouldn't go back and exactly change the answer I gave in that book, it was good enough. My next book just explored that beyond, like, what, like, because I had to answer that for myself. I mean, for the first time in my life, I was in the middle of a situation that made no sense. And I mean, I come from a divorced family. My parents split up when I was 15. You know, like, I had a lot of crap in my background, if it's okay to say that. No, no, you can say whatever you like. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, so I had, I had stuff, I, I had been through grief several times before. And I knew enough about the process to know that I would get through this. So that was huge. Yes. And to know that if I, you know, if I did the work, there was an outside to this help, right? Yeah. But I also, you know, understood that it was probably the worst thing anyone ever can go through. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, I can only think of a hand, like really, like a tiny handful of things that are, might be worse, and only a tiny. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not a big list. And and yeah. you know, and since and since this happened, I've heard of so many worse stories where people like lose their entire family, or yeah. you know, like, and you know, we have that tendency to compare. That was one of the things I learned. We can we have a tendency to to blow off our own pain because someone else's is worse. Well, that is actually something we shouldn't do. Um, it's a, basically a way of deflecting, dealing with our pain because. Yeah, your pain is just as valid as mine, actually, even if mine seems worse to you. So, yeah, just, I would, that's something that I, I would no, like. It, no, 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 it, it's fair. I, I would go so far as this. We wrestle what we can handle. And yeah. that's, and that's, and that's an honest, I think that's an honest assessment of, I look at what I've been through. And if someone comes to me, it's like, oh my God, my house payment's not going to go through. I, I don't take that as seriously as someone that's, um, but I had to wonder where food's coming the next day. Right. I, I don't have that, like, that's not a problem to me. Yes. But I also recognize, too, my experiences are completely different from theirs. And as a result, what they're wrestling with, what I'm wrestling with, I never owned a home. Yep. Right? So, which means I, I can't, like, the stresses that come with that, they don't apply to me at all. So there's yeah. things I don't understand. Yeah. Now, personal, that will never bother me even with a home right yeah. but again it's what we wrestle with right yeah, we're all in our own place in our own journey yeah exactly and that's probably one of the things I've learned is just to give a lot other people a lot more grace you have no idea what someone else is going through exactly and what it means to them I mean as we mature we, di we di discover what we can survive and you know like I went through this whole journey and I've come out the other end and I'm not saying I don't grieve because you grieve forever but I I'm thriving you know that's I've gotten to the point where I'm not just surviving I'm thriving and I recognize that like if I can go through that there's probably not much that I can't go through yeah and my faith is stronger because of the questions I asked and how I railed like, at God and, hey, well, and, well, no, well yeah I so, mean so that was your Job moment it was. Yeah. yeah I suppose. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, Joe yeah I even actually have a whole blog post about Joe right early in that process. Yeah, that yeah. Like yeah. Mad. My, 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 <laughs> I got to watch my dad wrestle with God. Uh, I, uh, I I grew up like towards the end. Now, 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 see, I'm old enough. See, now I'm old enough and wise enough to call my dad on his own bullshit now, which is uh, which is really good. Um, That's fun for both of you. Uh, yeah. Oh no! It, it, actually, he he gets a hoot out of it. Actually, he does get a hoot out of it because um, you need you. You need to be able to stand up to your parents yeah. at some point. Yeah. You have to be able to do it. And every time I do, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of pride in that, right? Because he's like, yes, he's not. He's got a backbone. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, well, fuck you too. But I mean, it's. <laughs> uh, but I mean, but there's a. But I got to watch him wrestle, and I got so I would hear every night about two big people in the Bible in particular. Jonah, which my dad in a lot of ways is a lot like Jonah. Good and bad, he is a lot like Jonah. Right? Good and bad. Um, right? Um, and Joe. Yeah. Right? How did Joe, like, 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 like uh, and one of the things you just say, it's like, God, I knew he was putting him through that stuff because at the very beginning, you just see God and Della having a little conversation. And he would talk about that. God picked that fight, actually. I see, I see, yes, he did. Absolutely. Yeah. He played the devil, not the other way around. Right? But, um, but, but the thing, of, but the thing, of, and I, I, and I realize it's going through my own struggles, even though it's bad in that moment. And there are points in my life where I, I look at what I've been through. It made me who I am today. Yeah. I'm stronger. I, I'm more driven. I'm. I know what I can survive, and I know who I am. And I wouldn't have known all that if I hadn't gone through the things I've been through. Mm-hmm. And that's a big. That's a big thing. Like making making peace with who I am, what I want, why I'm here. I have no idea where I'm going. But besides that, you're right. You're right. But I mean. But that's what that, that's what that's what life's about. Like like I'm not gonna say this in every case, but at least with me, I can look at the bad things I've been through and I've taken a lot of good things from that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and that's what they're for. Um, one of one of the lessons I learned from from what happened to us was probably I would say that grief is probably the most important tool that God uses to reshape our character. Yes. Uh, and it, it gives you a real decision-making moment. You can either choose to harden, or you can t- choose to soften and uh, be- become a more loving, more open person. And you know, not everybody makes a good choice. <laughs> but I, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to go back to like full circle. I, I don't. People that make different choices than what I would make, I don't hold it against them. Because I, I again, going back to something we talked about earlier, didn't walk in their shoes. I don't know what they've been through. I, I right, and I, and so, right, with with God, with God, there comes a point in your life you have to be willing to surrender. And what, it, what and again, whatever, and, the, and for the purposes of this podcast, we're just going to say whatever you believe in. I believe we believe what we believe, but whatever you believe in, this, this is still this will still apply. But there comes a point where you have to let go, and no matter where you are in your struggle, and if you if you let go, you take whatever that bullet is, you just take it. But when you come out on the other side of that, you're still standing. Right, you change and you soften and you, you're a different shape altogether. Yeah. If you don't, you can choose like you said, to harden. Right? It's that fear of letting go. Yeah. Right? And and it's uh, it's those fears that and they might be valid. Like they're like you like I look at there 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 are things that maybe you're not ready to deal with. Maybe there are things where there are things you just you're not able to process or handle. Look, I, I know when I get when I get to the other side, I'm not gonna get a passing grade on everything I did. Lord knows. <laughs> I've done some things and I and I have flaws. Fundamentally huge flaws. We all do. Yeah, exactly. You are not alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well no, absolutely. But that's my point. 
I'm not going to pass every trial. Yep. Right? I'm not supposed to. That's right. Right? He, it, he knows that. He's okay yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm not supposed to. I'm, I'm supposed to hopefully progress. I'm hopefully a better person I am now than I was a few years ago. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. Right? But, I mean, that's, that's the thing, right? I can't look at someone. There, there are people I know that have been through certain things that they're hard. And... I can't blame them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And everybody does handle grief differently. Yeah. But I think, you know, like, uh, one of the things, I keep coming back, I have learned a lot of lessons because of what happened. Um, but it's just that God, one of the things that I took away from that that I have put in, I put into my next book and I wrote after that, Finding Heaven. Um, and I'm just going to interject right now. I was going to write my, my mermaid story next. But after that happened, I couldn't. I wasn't in a place where I could. And kind of all the pieces fell together for another story idea I'd gotten while I was taking the course. And I ended up writing my next novel, Finding Heaven, which is about an, a woman who's recovering from an abusive past with the help of a humanitarian who works as sex trafficking victims. And it's not about child loss, but that writing that story helped me grieve. Yeah. Because you still have to go, you have to answer the same questions. Like, I was, you know, like, he was innocent, or I was innocent. How, as a victim of childhood sexual abuse, how, you know, they are some of the people that have the hardest time trusting God. And I had to go through a lot of that while I was writing that book. Well, they just have a hard time trusting, because they're, they're betrayed on a very fundamental yeah. level everywhere. And that's how I felt. Yeah. It was like, there was no reason for that. You could have done something. And so, what... You know, that whole question, why does bad thing why do bad things happen to good people? Or God, how could you let this happen to me? Which is usually what the more personal thing is, people get angry. People lose their faith for things like what I went through. And uh, you know, I was really struggling, but it's like, you know what, God didn't make that happen. Um, we live in this world where he's full of crap. Absolutely. And he lets us make our own choices. And much as it was hard for me to admit, I mean I I feel Mom guilt is totally a thing. It's way worse grievous, grieving guilt when you're the mom. Um, I really feel like I should have been there to prevent my very busy three-year-old from doing that, but I wasn't. And he'd also been told. He knew he wasn't supposed to be there. So he also had his own responsibility as well. You know, so it's just like, you got to realize, we live in a world, we have our own choices. And those choices, God doesn't interfere with those choices, even if the results are going to be bad for you or for someone else. He lets natural consequences take effect, right? And uh, because for him, it's not about us having this perfect, pampered, wonderful life. It's about us turning to him. That's what he wants. He just wants us to have a relationship with him. And that's what I believe. And so so I, I say this often. It's like, you know what? God doesn't cause these bad situations, but he doesn't waste them. Yeah. So that's why I say everything we go through, it's an opportunity. It's a choice to become a better person or a worse person, basically. And so, yeah. Uh, so I got that idea for Finding Heaven. And that was kind of in the fall. And by January, I had decided I wanted to be a writer for a living. That was when I decided that. I also knew I really wanted to get out of that business that I was in. I was, it was killing my soul. So I sat down and I made some goals. And I said, by October of this year, which was 2016, I wanted to be able to, to close the doors on this business. I had no expectation of selling it because of the kind of business it was. Um, but I thought, well, I want to be able to have enough income from doing other things. So you don't need to do that, that, I do, that I don't need that. It wasn't a lot of income to replace, I'm going to be honest. So it was a pretty achievable goal. <laughs> that was the other, because it was, it was so frustrating. I was spending so much time on it, and I was, I was making like... Nothing. Yeah, almost nothing. So anyway... So a few months later, um, my, we have a regional magazine in, in Peace River called Move Up, and it's a promotional magazine for businesses in the north and the, and the community in general and, and stuff like that. And uh, they had a billboard up in town where the, the billboard said Creatives for Hire. And I totally misunderstood this billboard. I'm like, oh, they're hiring. I'm like, okay, you know, you know those risk moments where it's like you have this choice and like they had the phone number. I was literally, I was going into the post office and I got this, saw this number and I came out of the post office and I sat in my car and I called them. And I said, hey, I would like to write for you guys. 
what, are you looking for a writer? And and the editor, Terme, he's like, well, what have you done? I said, so I'll send you, I'll send you some of my blog posts when I get home. And uh, so I did, and I got a job. Yes. <laughs> and, and you know what? It's, I had no journalistic training at all. And um, my my editor, he's awesome, but he's also like super like laissez faire in some ways. You know, he's just so laid back, which is fantastic for me because I'm like too hyper sometimes. Like that. <laughs> I, I, I could see like relaxing is sometimes a struggle with you. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, yeah. he he kind of just threw me in the deep end, um, and I went and he says, "Can you go cover this story?" And it was actually like an in-person story and everything. And I'm like, "Sure." So I went and I did it, and I was like, "I don't even know. I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't have any recording apps on my phone. Nothing. I had no idea what I was doing." So I went and I did it, and over the next few issues, um, you know, they would train me. I'm a very quick learner, which is something that people who do a lot of different things tend to be. Um, and so I, I was able to learn more about what they expected from me. And uh, earlier, well, I'd say about a year, year ago, he, he basically said, okay, you're our lead writer. I, I, I essentially do between six and 10,000 words for them every issue, you know, about eight to 10 articles. Um, and yeah, it's been fantastic. So that's why my journalistic training came okay. <laughs> And um, gave me so much confidence too, you know, um, so that, so it's like paid writing work, like how awesome is this? <laughs> um, took about two years to get through finding, uh, to get finding heaven out because of, you know, the grieving process. So was, I, when people ask me how long it took to write, I'm like, well, it was about a year of actual writing, but there were long periods in there where I wasn't writing. Um, but yeah, so but Finding Heaven Out, that was published in November 2017. Oh, by the way, also October 2016, yes, I did close the doors on that business. And actually my supplier, that company who had bought my mom's company, they bought it from me. So I even got a few thousand bucks because they didn't want to lose the eBay. Uh, uh, they, didn't want to, they didn't want to lose the outlet. So. They, they didn't want to lose that audience. But I had a very loyal customer base um, because I'm, I'm very good at customer service. So <laughs> anyway, I'm like, well, okay, good luck. Because <laughs> it was the customer service part that, that I was struggling with with them. But um, they're still doing great. So I, I applaud them. Anyway, so yeah. At that point, I'm like, okay, yay. And I, I, this was where I really, and with Finding Heaven too, going back to the Christian publishing thing, um, it's a non-sanitized version. It is definitely got, it's got faith themes. The main character oh, sure. goes through a really, you know, she's angry with God at the beginning, and then by the end, she's, she, you know, it's, it's a, one of those stories that's really hard to read for some of it, but at the end, you leave it, you leave it, and you're just like, Wow, I have had so many people ask me if there's going to be a sequel. Um, it's got extremely good reviews from the people who've actually reviewed it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just one of those stories that you, you probably aren't ever going to forget if you read it. Um, it was hard to, to know what to, to call it as a genre. It's women's fiction, romantic suspense, domestic noir, I don't know. Um, but it's got swearing, so I couldn't I couldn't pursue a Christian publisher, and I figured it probably had too many faith-based themes to be uh, traditionally published with secular press. I wasn't really sure, but I'm like I already know how to do the independent publishing thing, so I just did it. Yep. And uh, you know it's it's been fine, and I just thought you know this rather than you know beating down doors for years and then doing it, I'm just going to do it now. I have no problem with doing that. But I kind of thought, you know, with the Undine's tier, when I was started with this young adult mermaid thing, well, this would be a commercial book. Maybe I'll start looking for an agent, and you know, like I'll go the traditional publishing route with with this one. And you know, just some of the articles I've been reading and stuff, I I, I still believe there is a place for traditional publishing. But when when the time came down to decide, I was looking at what's happening around the industry, and I'm like, you know, I think I'd rather. I, I mean, I like that control, so I. I I just thought, you know, I'll just, I'll just go for it. Yep. Um, you know, uh, authors like Adam Dries have done it very well. Yes. With uh, with independently publishing young adults, and he's, I, I, Adam, if you're listening, I consider you a mentor. Yes. <laughs> Um, he, he, he's sponsoring the podcast right now, so it's, it's, it's all good. Does he listen to them all up? I don't, I don't, I don't know, actually, to be perfectly honest with you, but 
So I'll, I'll tell you if I, I'll tell you how me and him became friends. I interviewed him for a podcast similar to this. Yeah. And we got, like, we ended up talking for, like, a half hour after this thing aired, and we've been really good friends ever since. We talked about some really cool stuff on the podcast, uh-huh. took about deeper stuff when the podcast went off the air. Right. Um, because I, I, it was just, we hit the right, we just hit the right beats at the right time. And, uh, he, no, he's definitely someone, like, he's one of those people that, he's one of the people I will go to for advice, mm-hmm. because... It's like, okay, what am I doing here? What should I do here? And and like I said, he, he's been a good friend. And I, I, I really appreciate it. And I, and I he uh, gets a big thank you, actually, in the novel. Like, he gets a really big thank you. He's also the, the kind of the base, a little bit of the basis of the villain in the story, too. <laughs> But, oh, I mean, he's gonna love that. No, 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 no. I, I, I told, I told him, I told him up front. Oh, yeah, well, no, awesome. no, well, 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 because uh, he, he, okay, uh, that, uh, that's this, that's my new story for this podcast. Um, so he shows this picture of himself in a steampunk like like regalia, right? Yeah. I looked at him, it's like you know, he almost looks like an evil wizard, right? He almost <laughs> does. So he almost does. So I, I didn't. I, I, so I, it was in my head. No, 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 to, totally, right? <laughs> so then he's twittering something about uh, like, uh, like being a villain, and he actually shows a thing of Mr. Bigglesworth. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god, I gotta do this. I have to. I have to do this because this is good. So I took, but the, the so again, it became a different character. But it started off as, okay, what if Adam used his presentation powers for evil? What would that oh actually? Oh my gosh. That's it, right? <laughs> Right, and I came up with in the, in the context of my story, cause the the one thing the one thing I don't think that would ever change whether I ah, was a good guy or a bad guy is the great dad. He's an amazing, amazing parent. Yeah. And so that was the basis. Like That's everything, awesome. everything he does is for his kids. Yeah. Right. But I, in the in the story, not 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 so many good things. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just. Like- grew on that despicable me hey? he's yeah. like the, the good dad but kind of <laughs> he's a bad dad at first <laughs> well no but except, except he, 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 he he even in that story he's a good dad yeah he dotes on his daughter which actually if you ever met adam he kind of does though oh, yeah. he totally does he, 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 to, he, he totally does but in yeah. a good way he loves his kids yeah so i'm like that, i'm not going to change that but i'll make i'll make i'll go there now obviously the character evolved into something very different as well yeah. but that's where it started right that's fun yeah well, i'm sure that he'd appreciate that that was the, the part of him that you yeah that you kept um, actually, I, I had done a beta read for Adam for the King's Horse, yeah. and uh, I had done it over that winter, 2017, and I, I did a huge book tour. It was the first time I ever did publicity for my book, because it was the first time I had a real book to, pub, uh, to, to, to publicize, so I did that in early 2018. And so I was coming down to Calgary. I did an insane thing. I had I had trips that were three and four days long. Uh, every two weekends, five of those. So from January until March. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Actually, well, January to March probably not. But yeah, I did get. Yeah, for but, a reason. but 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 if I would make it just just for fun, do me do me a wonderful favor. One of my friends on Facebook is Dirk Manning. Look him up sometime. Derek Manning. Dirk Manning. Dirk Manning. Just 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 look him up. You know, I I think I think you'd appreciate his his efforts. You'd be like, whoa. <laughs> okay, I yeah, yeah. I'll be like, Josh told me to stalk you. Yes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so, so Adam actually met me for coffee yes. um, last spring, and uh, and it was yeah. really great just kind of picking his brain. He had actually given me some advice for even how to get started on getting that, those book tours put in place. And now, by the way, he has a really great book coming out about that, about doing book signing, so you should totally pick it up. Five critical things. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome, Adam. <laughs> I'm giving it away on the podcast, too. Oh, are you? Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Actually, he gave me a copy last night, and I'm, like, almost halfway through already. I'm, like, i got a cram. I've got a whole weekend of book signings coming up. Anyways, uh, so, yeah, I decided I would go ahead and self-publish with the Undines tier as well because I thought, you know, I'd rather know these things and, and know how to make my business work and kind of leave that in the control of other people. But the interesting thing about control, and you, you mentioned how driven I am several times, and I know that I am. Well, one of the things that I learned while I was grieving and writing Finding Heaven, I actually found out why I'm so driven. And like many of us, it goes back to wounds from my childhood, and I'm not going to get into them. But it actually helped me to reevaluate 
my purpose for being so busy. Because I had to have that time where I'd step back and I just, I was just really just spending time. I mean, when you go through trauma, um, and and even just a, a normal death can be a trauma, but when you go through a traumatic loss like that, your adrenal glands take a huge hit. And I've heard it takes about two years to come back from that. And I would say that's at least right, at least that much. Um, and somebody like me, they we work with a dread a little lot. <laughs> Going. And so I had, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't be busy. I had, I didn't have the energy. And so I basically just had a lot of time to think and, and kind of reevaluate my life. And because I finally was able to look and see why, um, why I was doing the things I was doing and what was truly motivating me and who was I trying to impress, I go, that's not healthy. That's not what I want to do. And so, I was able to then, and that, you know, it's not long after that I got the boundary setting thing going, and I was finally able to start saying, okay, if I'm going to be busy, I want, I want to know why. I want to know where I'm going, not where I'm running from, where I'm trying to impress. And I'll be honest, there was some fallout from that. Um, there are things that I'm still dealing, dealing with in some of my relationships, which I am optimistic because that's who I am. I'm hopeful that those things will resolve, but they may not because I finally stood up and said no. This is well, well, no, yeah, no, that. My life now. Mm-hmm. So, about it's a little over a year. It's about a year and a half ago. My teeth were busted from my time in Arizona. I went through a really, really interesting little personal trial in my life at that point. Okay. And I came back and I fixed. I I, I did a GoFundMe to fix my teeth. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Look great. Yes. But, but. When I told my story, we're gonna go full. You don't need to know who this is. That author came coming back because he does play a role in that story, but like not a great role either, okay. unfortunately. But he, he came on my he came on my uh, Facebook page and he was fighting everybody for like two days. Yikes! But it was it was interesting because it was it was a reevaluation point for me because. When I went to fix this, I had to let... The cool thing about the scars we have is there comes a point that we are not our scars anymore. We are simply who we are. We can let our scars go. But you have to face the things that that drove you. I needed that moment with him because it was able. I was able to, at that point, to have closure, yeah. right, and move forward. I could I could move forward, and I, I could let go a big source of anger um, because I had that moment I was like okay I finally was able to get some things off my chest I needed to say and I don't regret saying them we're not friends and we never will and we probably never will be friends again I'm okay with that it was more important for me to come to terms with what I've been through and where I'm going than to be his friend yeah Sometimes, I mean, that, that boundary setting sometimes does end relationships. No, no, no. It, oh, oh, yeah, and sometimes in unexpected ways. Yeah. Right? And then that, that, the revelation of what people want came earlier. And that actually crystallized certain things. And when I fixed the teeth, ironically, Adam has said this, like, the moment this is done, there are things you're going to be able to tolerate still, but there are going to be things you just won't. Yeah. Right? You just <laughs> won't. And, and it's true. Some of my friendships, some of the friendships I've lost, have surprised me. Yeah, I would say the same for me. Yeah, have surprised me. On the flip side, who's still there? You appreciate them more because oh, yeah. because they are the ones that will stick with you through thick and thin. They will be there. Um, one of them, like I, I had, I I just literally just broke up with the relationship but the interesting thing about this breakup it was almost like the best breakup ever in one sense right. because yeah it sucks that they, we had to break up yeah. but we're still really good friends okay. and it, it, right and it's not I didn't lose a friend I lost an aspect of the relationship but we might actually have an overall better relationship if that actually makes yeah. sense right yeah, sometimes that happens but, if yeah. people can handle it and kind of yeah, yeah yeah and don't get me wrong I mean I mean the bound our boundaries haven't fully reset yet to where they where they're eventually going to be 
but she's my friend. I'm great, and, and and I'm her friend, and we're there. And that's and that's and that's a good and that's a. Like I said it was it was oddly the best breakup ever. And, <laughs> And I say that without, like, like with that, like, and I, and I may, I mean, there's a, I mourned it, yeah. but I didn't, I didn't have to lose the person. Right. Yeah. And that's awesome. a good thing, right? Yeah. Just kind of your relationship evolved a bit. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Evolution. Awesome. Ev- evolution. Right. It was just. <laughs> Actual evolution. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so we're pretty much caught up. Um, I did eventually get the Undine's tear up. By the way, the un- un- Undine is a Greek, Greek word for an elemental water creature. And I call my, my, in my post Atlantean society of mermaids, I call them Undines because I was answering that question about where are all the mermen. Yes. And I'm like, mermaid, merman, that's not the name of a race. That's just a very gender specific term. So I found the word undine, and I'm like, that's what they are. Yeah. So I love it. Uh, nobody knows how to pronounce it, though, so now you guys do. <laughs> oh, I did. I did. Oh, awesome. I, 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 I play collectible card games. I, I know exactly. Oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I know, hear that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and even though this one's young adult, and I'm approaching it completely different in a, in a ten, it was like this historical alternate world, um, it's like an alternate history kind of thing. Uh, I'm still dealing with issues of, 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 that I hope kids get about about love and control and how those things work because as I was kind of revamping my own life, I realized that what I was trying to do was protect myself by having control of everything. <laughs> that and doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I lost my son, I realized I have actually control of nothing. That control is an illusion. Absolutely. And also, um, you know, I'm blessed with a very wonderful marriage, but there's a lot of people who aren't. And, you know, going through the, the research and learning about, you know, about uh, dysfunctional families and realizing how, much, how dysfunctional my own had been as a child, uh, you know, I, I came to realize that, you know, even, even without sexual abuse, there's a lot of ways that you get messed up with the controlling relationship. And, uh, you know, so I just want to, I'm hoping that one of the things that kids get from the book is to see the difference between a healthy relationship um, and a controlling one. And unfortunately, those controlling relationships are, have been portrayed a lot as good things in recent runaway YA novels. And so I'm, I'm hoping to provide a counterbalance to that in some ways. So one of my favorite... It's one of my favorite lyrics, although that album I generally sucks from, Metall- from from Metallica, is "Love is control, I die if I let go." The idea that the idea is, right? It's, it's he's lying to himself, right? Yeah. That's, oh that's, yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. opposite of love. <laughs> you know, no, absolutely. Yeah. That was the point. Yeah. Right, right because he, he, he control is as much of an addiction. Yeah. Uh, the illusion of control is as much of an addiction as anything else on out there. I have moved. I'm originally from Ontario. I've lived in Arizona, Michigan. I've lived here. I've lived in lots of places in between. My life has bounced around anywhere and everywhere you yeah, can possibly yeah. imagine. Sounds interesting. <laughs> right. I, I, I learned a long time ago, and in fact, even even. I've just become smart enough to realize I'm not in control. I don't need to be in control. I, the only thing I'm in control is what I do with what with my situation. That's it. It's the only thing I'm in control of. I, that's my controllable. I can show up and do what I'm supposed to yeah, do in exactly. any situation I'm given. That's it. That's it. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. I don't need to... Even the results... It's raining outside right now. Yeah. I could get mad at the rain. <laughs> it's still gonna fall if I get mad at the rain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I, it's one of my I have six I, I have six I have six rules to life. Okay. Show up. Do your shit. Don't quit. The rest is rain. And that's actually going that's rule four because you can't control where success falls. You can't control a lot of things in this way. There's no control. The paradox of success is that you can do everything right and still not succeed. And you gotta actually accept that, that that's part of the reality of what you're getting into. All you can do is put yourself in the best position to succeed. Doesn't mean you're going to. And you have to accept that going in. But when you do succeed, get out of your own way, 
And finally, this is the la- this is the last one. It's my newest one. No excuses. Okay. Uh-huh. You do what you want to do. Either way, don't don't give you gotta, yourself. You gotta own it. You own it, right? You yeah. do what you want. <laughs> so own it. Deal with it. Move on. Don't give yourself no no excuses to anyone, and especially to yourself. Mm-hmm. Give go all in. if you're going to show up. Go all in. Yeah. Get out of your way. Just go all in. That's it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Those sound like pretty good rules. Yeah. At first I was going to say it's like Josh's version of like the urban serenity prayer, but eh, there's some extra stuff in there. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, no, 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 the urban, the urban, the urban, my, my serenity prayer, what will be, will be, that's it. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't worry about anything else. Like, what will be, will be, I'm here to do my thing, I'm going to do my thing, and I'm getting out. That's it. That's it. Yeah. And that sounds like the recipe for happiness right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, there's a lot of grief you avoid if you have that attitude. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's basically... How you got in? How I, how I got here. So, this, so so one question. That was our, this was our whole chat. Yeah, I know. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> I can see why you didn't send me questions in advance. <laughs> <laughs> not what I do. It's just, you know, yeah. it's like, send me questions in advance. Uh, no, we're not going to, I don't do that. <laughs> That's all right. It was, it's been fun. Yeah. yeah. So, so should I give the, the, the elevator pitch? Then you, so, so to conclude the interview, yes, the elevator pitch is a yes, but also where people can find you. Okay. All right. So, uh, so my book is The Undine's Tear. It's the first in a young adult science fiction trilogy, science fantasy trilogy, I should say. And it's about a post-Atlantean society where the mermaids, called Undines, uh, have to capture human men to survive. But they don't just capture them, they enslave them. And they don't just enslave them, they mind enslave them. So uh, our heroine, her name is Calandra, and she is the most powerful mermaid healer, or Undine healer, in 3,000 years. So they're expecting that she's going to be able to heal the Heartstone, which is this magical power source that protects their island. Um, because it's been basically, it's on the verge of collapse now. They haven't been able to do this for 3,000 years. And um, unfortunately, she's not sure she can. She is very, very powerful, but she's also been being mentored by the only undine male she's ever seen in her dreams. And he is kind of an odd dude, but he's all about control. And so some of the lessons she's learned from him are conflicting with what she's learning from her mentors. Anyways, also, another aspect of it is I have a secondary um, point of view, main character point of view, a young boy named Zale, who is a male undine. He grew up in England. And right at the beginning of the book, uh, a cherub shows up. She's a, she's a shape-shifting sphinx. And she basically says to him, uh, don't laugh. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I, know, I just, just the character just sounds amusing. Like I'll say, you know, like, I, like, 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 I'm sorry. I, just, I, I, I just, I pictured that in my head, and it just reminded me a little bit of like a Cheshire cat kind of character. Oh, okay. No, yeah. She's, she's, all of my characters are shapeshifters, um, and I did actually base this a lot on uh, uh, real mythologies, like I looked at a lot of extra canonical texts, like the Book of Enoch, to figure out kind of an older-fashioned way of looking at the spiritual universe. Okay. And I also have incorporated some other beliefs into it, because I've always had a real interest in um, anthropology, is that what it's called, and world religions, and, and stuff. Yeah. So I've had a lot of a lot of different ideas kind of that I've kind of synthesized into eventually what will make sense as a singular spiritual model of the world, I guess. Uh, it doesn't so much all come together in this book, but it will. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, so she tells him that basically he needs to help save his mother and the world. And he freaks out because he's only 16. <laughs> yeah. 
So anyways, and, and, uh, and as you say, actually, Zale and Abela are kind of the more lighter-hearted side of this yes. of this story because uh, Calandra, she's got a pretty strong sense of duty and she's been raised in a very serious environment, so she takes it all very seriously. Anyways, it is a lot of fun. It's been getting amazing reviews on Goodreads so far from my art readers, and uh, I've had some really fun moments so far. Um, I did a pre-launch in my hometown last Saturday, and there were two young 12-year-old boys there, and one of them was an exchange student for the other, and they each bought a copy, and then a couple days later, the the one boy's mom texted me this photo of the two of them sitting on, re, laying in bed together, reading the Aww. book, and it had been three days, and she said they're on chapter 38. Nice. And I'm like, holy cow, you know, <laughs> like it's hey, not a short fans, book. Hey, so. fans for life, that's exactly. awesome. Exactly, and, yeah. and, and the little, the French boy, he's like so excited about being the first guy in France to have it, and he's like, and you, ha she's made, he's made his, uh, his, uh, Exchange mom promise to send the next two over sign. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's that's a good moment. So yeah, it's been lots of fun. Yes. And I'm just really having fun with the story and everything. And I've also now started writing other things. I'm trying to learn, learn to write short fiction. So I wrote a story for Constellate Easing. Constellate Easing earlier this ah, year. Ah, I, 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 I've seen it. Uh, I, I am, I'm a patient for that. I, I'm, okay. a, I'm actually a big Ellen Michelle fan and as a she's person. She's awesome. No, she's no. awesome. <laughs> Wears her heart on her sleeve. And that's why I really, yeah. I actually really, she was also the editor for my first novel. So she edited Undine's yeah. tour as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that, that explains why she was so happy to see it. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, she was. She was actually. Um, I mean, I had I had some beta readers, but it's always that moment when you get. This is what I love. Okay, so she's like halfway through the book and she tweets. Uh, what she say? You know, it's it's so great having such talented clients that you just want to speed reach the end instead of do your job. <laughs> And I knew she was talking about my book. I'm like, oh, that's amazing. And then at the end, she messages me. She's like, I just finished. No. As your editor, it's perfect. But as a reader, I can't end the show. I'm like, okay. When your editor loves it, you know, it's well, That's good. No. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for, for me, well, we'll talk about me after. How can people find you? Oh, right. Uh, I am on, uh, well, my website is where you're going to find everything www.talinawinters.com and I'm going to let Josh put that on his yes on his post so that it will actually be spelled um, okay and uh, wow. and and I'm on faith sorry we've been yakking a long time oh yes <laughs> sorry I'm a talker no that's okay um, I'm also on Facebook at talinawinters.artist and I'm on Instagram and Twitter and recently I'm on LinkedIn because I've also started editing ha <laughs> one more thing <laughs> I I actually am a I'm a developmental editor at Adam's Encouragement, by the way. He's the one who, who got me started on that. And uh, so I'm also on LinkedIn doing that. That's cool. All right. And now you finally know how Talina became a writer and a lot of other things too. Uh, like I said, this was an awesome conversation. We, we talked even longer off the air about a lot of different things. Um, I, I uh, really got the opportunity to get into her head about how she approaches sales and that definitely helped. And like I said, this month, I'm giving away more copies of the Undine's Tier. The mailing list is up. All you got to do is put your email into the mailing list. There's a link at the bottom of the Podomatic description. Uh, I will be showing that in another copy of Five Critical Things this month. But I also want to pay attention to the Raven podcast. Uh, Jason just did his first live show. So, Jason, if you're listening to this, congratulations. Awesome. Definitely should check out the Raven podcast. Some really cool guests are coming up this month. Go to theravenpodcast.com awesome stuff there uh i love that you got a chance to talk to jacqueline Carey live i'm actually kind of a little jealous of him for that but uh it's a really really cool he's got some really cool stuff cooking up there and you should definitely check that out all right i'm going to go into great detail about this on the audio sorceress podcast i'm the featured author on audio sorceress this month our featured creator and i kind of want to do something exclusively to her but i am going to mention this really briefly here because i know a lot of people here are from that listen to the show are from Calgary and I really do appreciate the Calgary community. Um I go into detail this a bit further, but I've been thinking about this for about three months. And I've been and then I'm not gonna say a definitive when, how and why just yet, because I don't know. I'm I'm still doing some things in regards to this and there, this could be as early as tomorrow, it could be early six months from now. But I've come to the, the conclusion that I think I need to leave Calgary. Um this isn't 
an, a simple solution to me, uh, or simple decision either, I should say. Um, the reason being, the long and short of it is, I've become a very different person in the last couple of years. And I feel like people... I feel like while I don't think anyone's against me being who I am, I feel I need a new locale to kind of become who I want to become, at least for a little while. Will I come back to Calgary? I'll never say never. Um, like I said, I'm going into great details on the other Sorceress uh, podcast. If you want to listen to that. But the long and short of it is I just, I, I'm ready for a change. And I, I'm going to take steps to ensure it. Now, when this is going to happen, I don't know yet. I literally just started. There's a lot of little things I'm doing right now, and there's going to be more bigger things I'm doing in the future. But I kind of want to let people know, like this, this is definitely going to happen. I, the more I think about it, the more I think I want to do this. I need to do this. I need to make some big changes personally to grow and become more of who I want to become. That's it. That's all. Um, that all said. Um, I don't want to be ungrateful. Everybody in Calgary has been amazing that I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting and talking to. And I'll eventually, like I said, I'll get more detail in our sorcerers. But uh, this was not a, a simple decision, but it, it's one that I feel is the right decision. But for now, that'll do it for this episode of Just Joshing. So if you want to support the podcast, you can do so a lot of different ways. First off, subscribe to the podcast. I am on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. I am available on Podomatic. Just put your e- email in or just hit the subscribe button. Leave her a nice review if you want to. That'd be great. My books, The Watcher, Storm Dancer, Wandering God, are available through Mirrorwell Publishing. Definitely check them out, mirrorwellpublishing.com. Great little publishing house based out of Windsor, Ontario. They published my books. They took a chance on me. And I'm always grateful, so definitely check them out. Uh, my next book is Alice Zero. I'm going to eventually have a lot. Like, this decision's part of it. But there is coming, as long as my first novel, A Cloud Diver, stay tuned for more details on that. As well, I have a YouTube channel, Joshua Pendelaresco. You can definitely find past episodes there. There's over 190 of them you can l- listen to. Um, beyond all that, I'm on Instagram, Facebook as J Pendelaresco. I have my Facebook page, Joshua Pendelaresco, author, podcaster. Find me in all those places. But regardless of how, what you do, where you go from here, Thank you guys very, very, very much for your support. I'm looking forward to the next episode. I can't wait to have that one come out. But until then, stay inspired, keep doing your thing, and I'll see you guys next time. Josh. Josh.